Hi, I'm JJ and uh, welcome to the vlog, JJ's War Games. Um, I should say JJ's War Games vlog is very much um, an adjunct to JJ's War Games, the vlog. Um, and I tend to put out videos here on the uh, YouTube channel really to uh, supplement the bulk of uh, my outputs which go to the blog. So um, everything I'm going to talk about here about the Trafalgar collection and the model of ships you see before you, um, you can find um, a lot more information and support materials and other ideas I've got around wargaming with these kind of models um, on JJ's War Games, the blog, uh, a link of which will follow at the end of this uh, video. So um, onwards with the uh, presentation, which um, as you might have guessed, uh, I've put together to look at the uh, Trafalgar collection of models that I've been working on for the last 18 months. And um, uh, a project that finally came to uh, completion April Fool's Day <laughs> on uh, at this year, 2021, um, with the last six models completed and added to the collection and uh, the fruits of the labour you can see before you. Um, before I dive in to take a closer look at this collection and uh, my ideas about how to um, use it going forward, I thought it might be worth just sort of like trying to um, pin down what it is about Trafalgar, I think, that um, captures a lot of naval war games imagination, certainly British naval war gamers. Um, it's a fundamental part of our history after all. And um, I'm going to sort of take some quotes uh, unashamedly from uh, Mark Adkins, The Trafalgar Companion. I mentioned this book um, when I did the uh, playthrough of the Leeward Line scenario um, by Warlord Games earlier this year in January um, and mentioned what a, an invaluable resource it's been for me putting this collection of models together and can't stress highly enough how uh, important a book I think it is for anybody who's interested in certainly putting together a collection like this to, to Wargame Trafalgar um, but for any of the other um, na major naval actions that um, uh, Nelson was involved in it covers um, the Nile uh, Cape St Vincent and Copenhagen alongside Trafalgar but alongside that it also covers a wealth of information on the way the navies uh, conducted themselves at this time how battles were fought um, and it's a real dip in resource uh, that I come back to again and again when I've been um, uh, looking for uh, interesting information and history about the ships as they've been built and completed and specifically when I've been looking to do uh, a look, look at on the histories of the individual modules, models themselves. So really, really well worth recommending getting a copy. That's really only available from what I can see second hand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was really fortunate to get my copy um, at the um, print price in 2005. It was about 45 quid. I got mine for 45 quid second hand. So they are out there and you can pick them up. Um, but I think, uh, you know, obviously they become uh, less and less available as the years go by. So um, I should also say I've got uh, Mark Atkins' Waterloo Compendium as well, which is equally a uh, valuable resource. But back to the naval uh, side of things. And I thought um, I'd, I'd quote directly from Mark Atkins' Companion because I think it really sums up uh, why Trafalgar uh, is such um, an epic uh, battle that appears on a lot of naval war gamers' bucket lists in terms of doing, and certainly British naval war gamers' bucket lists. So um, he, he uh, sums up in his introduction, written in 2005, of course. It is now 200 years since the Battle of Trafalgar, the most famous naval action in human history. For the British, it is the best remembered battle of them all. I would think that's very true. Uh, taking a place above even Waterloo in the national consciousness. Victory at Trafalgar gave Britain unchallenged mastery of the seas for 100 years. An island nation dependent on trade with a huge merchant fleet to protect and overseas possessions scattered around the globe. Britain's economic as well as military survival was heavily dependent on the Royal Navy. Not until the indecisive Battle of Jutland in 1916 did an enemy again challenge Britannia's rules over the waves. And then he goes on to talk about um, some of the, 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 the data and figures that feature around the, the action at Trafalgar, the Battle of Trafalgar. He goes on to say, the scale and importance of Trafalgar is demonstrated by the figures involved. It was a struggle between giants in terms of firepower. 
33 French and Spanish ships of the line, the combined fleet, faced 27 British. These 60 ships, all massive floating gun platforms, could produce a huge theoretical weight of shot. The combined fleet's 2,636 long guns could fire a combined broadside of 27.5 tonnes of iron. While the British ships carried 2,026 guns, that could deliver 19.5 tonnes. There were some 4,662 guns, mostly heavy, at Trafalgar, in comparison to the 537, mostly light, at Waterloo. Although not all the ships participated to the same extent at Trafalgar, it was a close quarter fight, with ships often slugging it out less than 50 yards, sometimes with their sides grinding together so that the guns could not be run out before firing. At these ranges it was difficult to miss. The battle raged for four hours. At the end, many ships on both sides were dismasted and crippled. Numerous holds flooded and hundreds of dead bodies were thrown over the side. Hundreds more men lay in agony on blood-stained decks. Dozens of casks full of amputated limbs were emptied overboard. A French ship exploded, and at the end the British had captured 17 enemy vessels, a huge haul and an extraordinary achievement. Ah, uh, yeah, so... If that doesn't fire um, a naval war gamer's imagination to want to uh, replicate this kind of a, a battle, um, <laughs> frankly, I don't know what would. Um, I did, you know, I've seen comments about why would you want to fight something where the British are uh, destined to to win a, a battle such as Trafalgar. Um, frankly, you could say that about any battle where uh, a victor uh, came out on top because of the extraordinary abilities of the people in that force and the equipment and the training and the doctrines used uh, against their enemies. Um, that's not what Wargaming is about, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm interested in um, seeing um, the vista of a game portrayed in such a way as to put the players and the people that look at the, uh, the game in the position of an observer perhaps 200 years ago seeing this from in this case a balloon let's say hot air balloon floating above Trafalgar um, and presenting the commanders with um, problems that their historical um, counterparts faced so win or lose is not really what playing the game is about um, as Nick Skinner um, from the Two Fat Lardies and I mention him because we're going to be using Kiss Me Hardy the rule set uh, mentioned at the conclusion of, of his um, Trafalgar uh, write-up, um, playing this game is not about the winning and how big a win you get. Playing the game is putting yourself in the place of the, 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 the people, giving you insight into the people that were in this action and just taking a moment to um, uh, you know, pay tribute to uh, their courage and their endeavour on all sides, not just the British, the Spanish and the French. Uh, fought equally hard for what they they believed, and um, yeah, to to um, try and educate and inform and and just you know really respect uh, what this this battle stood for. Let's let's talk about the um, collection and um, what we're looking at here. OK, so uh, this collection of models is 77 models. Um, along the front section here are the British in, in line from the, the, the Mightiest, which is uh, HMS Victory here at the end of the line, right through down to the um, diminutive little cutter Entrepreneur, which represents the British fleet. So we've got the first rates the single 80 gun uh, tunnel, um, third rate in the British fleet. The rest are of the third rates, which were 74s in the main, and then three 64 gun third rate ships of the line, four fifth rate frigates, and the two unrated, the cutter I've already mentioned, Entrepreneur, 
Entrepreneur and the um, Schooner uh, Pickle, which I've just featured in a recent post. And then obviously I've done the same uh, layout um, for the Spanish and French. So here we've got the Spanish in the middle. So I've got their, their four first rates here down the end, uh, their 280 gun third rates and their 74 gunners with their single um, 64 gun third rate here down at the back behind the British. And then at taking up the rearward line, I've got the French component of the combined fleet. So here we've got the four 80 gun third rates which are composed the the principal uh, flagships of the French fleet and the bulk of their fleet which were their 74 gun third rates and then they provided the light ships for the combined fleet so we've got the five fifth rate frigates uh, from the French and their two unrated brigs right down the end so that's 77 models um, 33 models are British 15 of the models are Spanish and 25 models are French um, alongside these 77, there are another 29 models in the cabinet, not on show here, composing principally of gunboats, frigates, brigs, sloops, a couple of Spanish 80 gun ships of the line, and one French first rate. So, 106 models built in 18 months, and um, they're all fully rigged. So, um, you, you begin to think, wow, okay, um, why, how, how does that happen? Um, well, it happens because of a pandemic, frankly. <laughs> um, I intended to do this project when I saw the Black Seas Warlord range of models um, uh, being premiered at Salute in April 2019. and was really blown away by the level of detail on these models um, and the impact of them on the table, the, the, the size, the, the, the sheer presentation of them and made my mind up that if, if uh, uh, Warlord were going to go ahead and produce these as a range then um, I was in but I wasn't going to do it as a um, uh, let's do some little skirmish Pirates of the Caribbean kind of games um, I wanted to do the kind of games, the historic games I'd always wanted to do but never really felt that the small scales for me quite um, enabled me to produce the kind of game I wanted. Um, and that's not to take anything away from other manufacturers and other scales. Uh, I've got a large collection of Langton 1200 below the table here. Um, and uh, we're very happy with them in their day. Um, but that said, um, when I saw these models, they, they took it to another level. Obviously, there are other large-scale model ranges that, that, that you could use. Um, Sales of Glory came out a few years ago. Again, they produce some very nice models. They're already built and uh, practically ready to go out of the box. And if you are prepared to spend the money, you can quite easily build some large collection of models and do this kind of game. In fact, I've seen Trafalgar done with the Sales of Glory models. Um, they never really did it for me. Um, I've seen some beautiful um, scratch builds where people have taken the models, removed them from the bases. I, I never like the, the large bases on the Sales of Glory models, but they've taken those models and they've rigged them. Uh, there's one or two um, friends that I've sort of got to know through my blog who I've seen do this. And um, you know, once rigged, they can absolutely look stunning. Absolutely no doubt about it. Um, but you know you're paying for a, a, a painted practically built model and then you're going to repaint it and rig it yourself so the beauty of these I think is that you you do all that yourself but you are buying the raw model and you can turn it into you know practically whatever you want to do so I, I've taken generic 74s and um, built them in such a way that I can use them for other games but they have a British or Spanish or a a French look. I've tried to grab some of the characteristics whilst mixing in amongst their ranks the named models that um, Warlord have produced which um, frankly really enhance the collection even more. So for instance 
um, players of the game, the, the gamers themselves, will be able to see immediately that Victory and Royal Sovereign bear the name in their stern quarters and carry a lot of the characteristic look of the actual ships themselves. So they really do stand out as character ships, if you like, among the fleet, which is uh, what I was after. Likewise, for the French and Spanish, there are equally interesting models. We have the Santissima Trinidad down the end here, uh, which is obviously you know, a must for anybody who's interested in doing this, um, this era and these kind of um, level games. Uh, right down to the um, uh, Red Utabla, the Beau Centaur, the Indomptable um, Formidable. They're all here with their names on the back, so you know you've got the character built into these um, these fleets. Um, so what else can I talk about in terms of uh, the, uh, the collection? Well, um, putting these models up as I've worked my way through them, I've had a few sort of queries and questions, and I thought, well, it might be worth just putting them here on the vlog so that uh, anybody else um, listening to this needn't ask the same question because I've, I've, I've put it up already on here. So uh, all the models are 1 700th scale. That means we're looking at a uh, on the table scale of one inch equaling about 20 yards. Uh, the rules I'm intending to use, Kiss Me Hardy, are at one 900th scale. So they're coming out at about one inch to 25 yards, which is neither here nor there. And certainly not worth my while fiddling around to gain the odd uh, centimetre here and there on gun range or movement rates. So that's one of the particular reasons why uh, I've chosen Kiss Me Hardy is they fit in really nicely with this scale of model. Um, they are all Warlord models. There aren't any 3D printed uh, models here. Um, that's not to say I won't add some in, in, the, in the future unless Warlord happened to come out with a 50 gun fourth rate. Um, I'm going to have to add um, some 3D options if, they, if that's not the case. Um, there are some conversions here amongst the collection. So the um, 80 gun um, one of the 80 gun Spaniards, I think, is a converted 80 gunner, which basically means um, a third rate 74 cut in half. The shorter, two third rate 74s cut in half at different parts of the hull. Um, the shorter bits join to form a 64, so these are conversions, the 64s are shorter. And the two longer halves join together to make an 80 gun um, conversion. So um, there is a blog post on JJ's War Games showing how I did that and where to cut the models in half. It's a really simple modification, um, but produces a notice, noticeably smaller or longer um, third rate, which works perfectly for, for you know, representing the 80 and the 64 gunners. And indeed is something I will be using uh, when it comes to look at things like Camperdown, for instance, where the Dutch are using a lot of uh, small third rates, 64s, 60s, 68s, etc. That's what I'll be doing to produce those kind of models. Um, okay, what else? So, um, yes, all the ships are based on a 2mm acrylic base from Fluid 3D is the company I use. They produce them in sprues. Um, so, for instance, the first rate bases you can see here come in sprues of three. And um, I take a modelling knife and just cut into the sprue where the laser has left the little tab that joins it to the sprue um, and then pop them out. Don't push them out because I've learnt from the bitter experience that you can damage the edge of the base. I leave the film that comes on the, the sprue, I leave it on and take a file and just file down the little jaggedy bits around the edge where it joins the sprue, file that down while the, the 
the plastic film is on because that again that just protects the surface of the uh, the base while you're preparing it and then peel the film off and you've got this what I like it is really clear um, acrylic base uh, to which I attach the, the model and the model is simply attached using uh, general purpose um, adhesive I use a glue that we've got here in the UK called Yuhu U, um, UHU is the brand name I'm sure there must be equivalents uh, around the globe uh, but that's what I use as a general purpose glue and that allows me to um, position the model if you get the odd little bleed over at the edge of the hull um, it tends to shrink back in close to the hull and because it's, it dries clear it looks rather like a, um, a little bit of a bow wave coming away from the ship but I didn't want that because I, bow waves and wakes are not something that is emphasised in the artwork and I'm very happy just having my um, beautiful sea map which you can see here which is a 9x5 blue sea map from Tiny War Games for those who are interested uh, we use Tiny War Games maps in the club Devon War Games group and I, all my maps are Tiny War Games and I will be getting some more of these because I just think they are really nice uh, maps so um, that's a little bit of information on that Yeah, I mentioned the sea mat. Uh, yeah, and all the models are fully rigged. By that I mean they have standing rigging and they have running rigging. Um, and I, I just really think that last aspect of putting the running rigging around the standing rigging, the sails, really make these models stand out. Um, I appreciate it's not for everyone, and I appreciate that it can seem a little bit daunting to those that have never rigged these model ships. I've been rigging ships for years. Uh, ever since Rod Langton got going and uh, took some time very kindly at a show uh, to get his pen and uh, fag packet out. <laughs> Hi Rod if you uh, watch this and uh, quickly drew some diagrams for me about how you went about rigging uh, Spanish and French and British models. They have a slightly different uh, setup. Um, and then I started practicing on my first few 1200 Rod Langton models and I've just carried the same principles over to these 1700 kits. And I find they work really, really well, and uh, I will continue to fully rig all my models uh, for that for that reason. So, if you do find the process rather daunting, I have put together two videos of me rigging these models, um, so that you can follow the process of where the various lines go. Uh, plus, there is a PDF with sort of like little diagrams showing where I start and how I link things up that you can utilise as well. Um, all I would say is, if you've never done this and you find, you're thinking it's a bit daunting, um, just give it a go. You know, have a go. Get a frigate or a brig and model and, and um, just sit down over a weekend. We've got nothing better to do. Uh, get your thread together and um, start on the go. Um, and once you've done one or two of these, uh, it's surprising how quickly the um, uh, body memory kicks in and you start to remember where everything goes and start rigging these really, really quickly. That said, that is one of the reasons why I carried on uh, finishing this uh, project um, during the pandemic. Not only because obviously we've all had more time locked down at home, not playing games. So what better time to sit down and work on a modeling project? But also because the more you do of these model kits in terms of painting them and especially rigging them, the faster it becomes as a process. The mental memory builds. You know how to do these much, much quicker. There's less of the what we used to call in the, the, the training world, um, uh, you become unconsciously competent. <laughs> so you move from the uh, consciously competent to the unconsciously competent. You, just, you could do one of these in your sleep practically once you've done a few of them. And I've got it to the point now where I tend to work in batches of four to six models. Uh, six is a nice figure to work with because um, they usually take, I don't rush them, I like to just do a bit here and there and do an hour and hour at a time, hour and a half. So to paint one of these uh, models, or well, six of them would probably take me a couple of weeks just to get them nicely done and washed and prepared. And then um, I could rig one of these models in probably about half a day. Uh, but again, I don't rush them because I just enjoy doing it. It's a very uh, pleasant experience rigging one of these kits. And so I will probably do one a day and do it at my leisure. Um, uh, get to the end of the week, get the colours and ensigns up, 
um, just take them upstairs and finish them off by uh, varnishing out any super glue marks or anything like that that's on the model uh, base them and then the next day they get photographed and put on the blog so you know six models in a week rigged is very easy in fact if I really went at it full pelt I'd probably do two a day and have the done have the thing done in, in half the time but yeah I just enjoy the process and do it at my leisure and plus I've got other things to do uh, and my wife would probably have a thing to say if I just spent all my time rigging model ships so um, so that is the um, the collection um, I thought now I'd just talk a little bit about um, the rules and um, some of my ideas about um, playing the game with them because obviously 1700 does present some interesting challenges uh, if you're going to try and stage something as large as Trafalgar um, and one of the principal things that comes to mind is the size of the game because um, for instance the Lardies in their summer 2005 write-up of their Trafalgar game for the commemoration um, for that, that year uh, Nick, uh, Nick Skinner emphasised the fact they needed a 12 foot table lengthwise to allow the combined fleet to set up in one twelve hundredth. Um, now I know we're using the same ground scale but the size of the models really requires uh, practically double the amount of table space so I'm aiming to look at minimum of 18 feet this is a 9 foot table so two of these lengthways ideally I'd like another 5 foot on the end of that maybe take it up to 24 feet um, to um, make sure I've got loads of room for Dumanoir and his van to swing around and come back to uh, deal the fatal blow to Nelson's plans that he couldn't manage in the real thing. Uh, <laughs> um, in addition to that, you're going to need, um, ideally, another one of these five-footers over the other side, at least one, um, potentially two, just to, for completion. But one would allow you to get both columns, British columns, their full length coming bearing down on the uh, combined fleet line is the way I'm thinking. So um, so yeah, table space for the big battles. That said, Trafalgar and Cape St Vincent are the biggies. Um, they will require some space, and I'm now working on building up my Spanish to do Cape St Vincent. But you've got smaller actions that would probably fit in quite nicely on these nine by fives. I'm thinking of things like Algeciras. Um, well, especially where you've got one fleet at anchor, which they had uh, four French ships at anchor in, in the Spanish Bay. Um, the Nile, uh, 13 French ships of the line, their frigates behind them, anchored in the bay. Um, you could do that quite, I would imagine, quite happily on the 9x5 table. So, you know, um, you cut your cloth accordingly. Uh, if you're going to do the bigger actions, which I'm going to do, I see them as events. They're the kind of games you put on specifically on a special occasion i'm looking to run them as a charitable effort so we've raised a lot of money at devon war games group for combat stress my preferred charity uh, but this has obviously got strong naval connections and um, really quite keen to um, put some of those monies towards uh, the naval charities as well uh, the charities have had a hell of a time uh, obviously raising monies during the pandemic all the normal activities of uh, running marathons etc have been put on hold while we've been all locked down so their money raising capabilities have been really hit hard and um, I think the war game community putting on nice show games can contribute to that uh, that pot um, in our own um, inimitable way which is what I'm keen to do uh, and I'd be ha happy to, to organize this game over regular periods if there's enough gamers who'd like to get involved. I, it's not just uh, the Devon War Games group. I'm sure there are other gamers around the country who, particularly if you play Kiss Me Hardy, would be interested. I'm talking to you lardy guys out there. Um, please drop me a line, get in touch, because uh, we run um, Clotted Lard at the Devon War Games group, so we are in touch with the, the lardy community from that aspect. We happen to be in a beautiful part of the UK, even if I do say my, so myself. Uh, there's a reason why the name of the county Devon rhymes with heaven and a lot of people like to come here on holiday for that very reason. So um, I can think of a worse place to go for playing war games and certainly we're not in that league. So 
yeah, Devon uh, is, is a great place to come and we can certainly help out with our experience running Clotted Lard in looking at maybe trying to get some venues sorted out to enable a group of players to come to cap together to do it. I'm aiming to, for the Trafalgar game, look to run it on the same um, ideas that um, Nick Skinner came up with, uh, Kiss Me Hardy. And I've also um, taken some of the ideas from the various supplements that have appeared in the um, uh, various um, Lardy Summer Specials around things like signalling. So um, I've got some stuff built around signalling for players if they want to use signals. Practically at Trafalgar, the signalling was over uh, about half an hour before the fleets came together. Um, both uh, Villeneuve and uh, Nelson realised that uh, this was going to be a pell mell close in melee. There's not much room for signalling once the ships become engaged. So uh, once they'd got their orders of battle sorted and their lines pretty much as they thought they were going to get them, that was it really. Uh, but that's not to say that applies to um, all the major engagements. And I'm thinking Cape St Vincent, there was quite a scope for a bit of signalling going on. So I've got, I've got that capability built in. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be working on the Spanish to get the, uh, the uh, Cape St Vincent game as an option. So, again, if other players want to get involved but don't necessarily want to do Trafalgar, because I've done Trafalgar, I've ticked them off my bucket list, then I'm aiming to do some of the other games as well. represent the battle over several hours so for instance fighting Trafalgar using Kiss Me Hardy I'm anticipating a whole day to play somewhere between six to eight hours um, what fun if we can do that over um, the 21st of October uh, then perhaps we might be able to um, uh, celebrate uh, the immortal memory in, in, in the best way possible and finish with a few jars at the end of the day to um, talk about where it all went wrong or where it all went right and have a bit of a laugh so, um, so yes, there are uh, other options with 1700 scale and uh, I'll be doing some smaller actions, uh, some small scenarios with these models, hopefully, as we get into um, getting released from lockdown so that I can illustrate the, uh, the playing with these models uh, uh, more so. OK, I think that's enough of me yakking on. Um, I'm going to take the camera now and do a little bit of a flyover of the models. And I will also do some close-up shots and some uh, little um, um, diagrams just illustrating the various uh, groups of ships that I've created and links to the, um, the models individually are available on the uh, blog and I'll put some more around so that if you want to look into them in a bit more detail, you can do. Just one note that won't, you won't have seen on the models as they've appeared on the blog. All the models here on the table are now numbered on the backs of their bases. Um, my version of a pennant number if you like the number is there to help ident make it easier for players to identify the models which will appear on their ship lists but also the number is used for signaling individual vessels if required um, which can be applied to the uh, signal sheet so so you'll see these in the uh, shots I'm going to do and that's basically what they are they're color coded I illustrated them on my post looking at the first rates just showing you how I've done it uh, red and blue for the French red and yellow for the Spanish and red and white for the British. So there we go. Okay, I hope you found that interesting and um, leave any comments you care to on the, uh, the blog, especially if they're nice ones. And um, if you want any information, I suggest the best place to get hold of me for comments is on JJ's War Games uh, on the blog. Okay, so um, just to do this uh, quick review of the uh, the uh, individual fleets, you'll notice I've rearranged the uh, table slightly just to help better illustrate the command ships that are involved in the game. And um, I've pulled them slightly forward of the uh, the groups that they are part of. 
Um, so we'll, we'll work our way along and just have a look at the, the models in a bit more detail. So if I start first with the, um, the British, um, here you can obviously see the uh, seven British three-deckers uh, with Victory closest to camera. Next to her is the Royal Sovereign and the thir uh, third first rate, a bit further along, is uh, Britannia, which was um, Rear Admiral North Esk's uh, flagship, uh, third in command in the British fleet, uh, with the other four vessels behind being the uh, 498 gunners, second rates. So if we just take a look at the uh, flagships in a little bit more detail, obviously you can see Victory flying her England Expects uh, signal. Uh, alongside her, I've given the uh, Royal Sovereign the honour of carrying the last signal that Nelson sent before the fleet's engaged, uh, illustrated by the two signal flags at the top of her mainmast, topped by the Blue Peter, which um, represents uh, engage the enemy more closely, being obviously repeated by Collingwood's uh, flagship. And then um, you'll also notice that the two uh, senior British flagships carry the Union uh, flag from their four, st four stays um, in front of the foremast there just to help pick them out a little bit more from the other British three-deckers as a, um, an identifier for the players. Okay let's just work our way along the line so the uh, first of the third rates is the uh, single British 80 gunner that was at the battle HMS Tonon, uh, formerly French Tonon. Um, she was captured obviously at Nelson's uh, famous victory at the Nile in 1798. And panning along we enter into the uh, long line of British 74 gun ships, two of which I've just pulled forward uh, representing HMS Orion and HMS Bellerophon. Uh, these two ships will be um, command ships in our game and they're two captains respectively, Captain Codrington and Captain Cook. John Cook, who was killed at the battle, um, will be um, uh, Commodores for our game. Uh, this is basically just to enable the British fleet to be broken down into more manageable chunks uh, with six to eight ships uh, being commanded by individual players. And um, just to help identify these two nominated flagships, you'll notice also that they too carry at the top of their main mast the um, engage the enemy more closely signal flags uh, to help pick them out. So um, that's those two vessels there from the seven, 74 gun lineups of the British and then moving along that little gap there identifies the three 64 gun third rates of the British lineup, uh, namely HMS Africa, Polyphemus and Agamemnon. Uh, you'll notice there also that they've got the smaller hammock nettings along the sides by their boat stack uh, for hammock nettings as opposed to I think it's about seven on the uh, normal third rate 74 so you can see they've got a shortened hull making them that smaller smaller looking ship and then as we pan out we can see the British uh, fourth rate uh, sorry fifth rate frigates uh, with um, Sir Henry Blackwood's HMS Euryalus pulled forward it was in fact the command ship for the British light forces at Trafalgar um, but it, it, he, he's not a separate command in the game and in fact the light uh, uh, frigates will be commanded by whoever uh, takes the role of Nelson um, and um, you know the frigates weren't really used very much as signal vessels in the actual battle once Nelson had got uh, got his uh, fleet arranged um, he didn't really have much use for them and formed them into another battle line ahead of the, his weather column but um, you know that's uh, flexibility is there for the Nelson commander to use and then just completing the British light forces are the recent additions of the schooner uh, pickle and the cutter entrepreneur looking very diminutive alongside the uh, larger 38 gun fifth rates so uh, yeah so that's the British lineup so might as well start from this end um, looking at the combined fleet so starting in the middle ranks we've got the 64 gun third rate Spanish ship on her own and then panning along up the line we have the rest of the Spanish third rates composed of their 74s now you can see they've all got their individual identifying pennant numbers on the backs of their bases there are the uh, two Spanish 80 gunners and then further along we have the uh, 
the four Spanish uh, first-rate ships of the line, of which three are pulled slightly forward to illustrate the three command ships. So starting along the line we have eight, which is the uh, Rayo. Then further forward we have the um, uh, 22, which is the... I've um, uh, got to get these the right way around. That is the Principe de Astorius. And then next to it is the Santa Ana. And then we have the Santissima Trinidad right at the end. So if I just close in on those three ships, you'll notice that they too are carrying their uh, pennants at their main and foremast just to help identify those respective commanders. Um, so that really makes the uh, Spanish line look rather impressive with those four three-deckers. And then coming along the rearward line of the combined fleet we have the French, of which we have the four 80-gun third rates. Number one obviously is the Beaucentour, Admiral Vice Admiral Pierre Villeneuve's flagship. Uh, next to her is the number 12 is the Formid Formidable, which was uh, Admiral Dumanois's um, flagship heading the van squadron. And then alongside are the two other 80 gunners, three and four, representing respectively the Neptune 80 gun and the four is the Indomptable 80 gunner. Uh, just see whether we can have a look at those slide on and you can see uh, Villeneuve and Dumanois are flying their pennants from their respective masts to identify them. Okay and then working our way along pan out a bit there we can see the lineup of the French 74s with that single 74 gun uh, gunner pulled forward which is obviously the Algeciras flagship of Rear Admiral Magon uh, who was number two in the uh, squadron of observation in the combined fleet. You can see his tricolour pennant there flying from his um, mizzen mast. And then just coming back out, scanning out, working our way along the line, you can see the four fifth-rate frigates um, and the uh, they were all 40 gunners, the uh, French frigate lineup, and the two much smaller uh, brigs uh, Foray and uh, Argus, the unrated. So there we go. Um, that's the uh, overview of the um, combined fleet uh, and the British fleet. So um, that is really the Trafalgar collection done. And um, I'm going to end the video there. And uh, the next model scene added to the collection will be looking uh, towards uh, Cape St. Vincent as the uh, next part to be added which will see those Spanish in the center there having nine additional 74 gunners and um, another uh, three first rates added to the Spanish lineup so we'll be able to do uh, Cape St Vincent. Anyway that's all for the future. Hope you enjoyed this and um, if you have been thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and if you'd like to know more about the collection as a whole, the models or any of the items mentioned, then can I suggest popping along to jjswargames.blogspot.com.